Well, it's about six o'clock on Wednesday evening, and we have uh, been trying to do our Bible class about 6 p.m. I know there's a bunch out there who are doing uh, Bible class on Wednesday evenings, and uh, uh, thankfully today we've had a lot better luck with our with our internet, and I uh, say all that, and it may go down on us here, but uh, so far so good. Had a had a good day today. We've been recording our worship services on Wednesday afternoon, for those of you uh, that weren't aware of that, and uh, trying to make them as, as real and as live and, uh, and all, but, uh, but just to be transparent, obviously, uh, we're doing those on Wednesday afternoons, and so it makes for a busy Wednesday afternoon, makes for a good afternoon. Uh, I kind of enjoy Wednesday afternoons because I get to see other people, and uh, get to interact with some others at a, at a safe distance and uh, get ready for, for our worship service. Um, I hope you're all well. I hope you're all safe. Uh, again, it's a, it's a great avenue. It's a, a wonderful blessing to have this technology and to be able to uh, come to you in this manner, but uh, certainly doesn't uh, take the place of face-to-face and person-to-person. And uh, whenever that time comes, uh, we... Uh, I've uh, been talking to some of the elders even this afternoon about what the future looks like and talked to some other preachers around the area this week. And so uh, I, I know there's a lot going on uh, depending on what state you're in uh, and watching this. Uh, every, each state is different, uh, but uh, of course, our, our governor here in Tennessee, he uh, he made a, an order yesterday and then he changed that a little bit today for certain people and uh, of course, it gives some recommendations and, and uh, still still got some time to go uh, with this virus and, and perhaps still got some time to go like this. Uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, tonight, uh, being the fifth Wednesday night, uh, if you attend Leoma regularly, you know that tonight is singing night. So I, I just thought I'd sit here and sing for 30 minutes. Um, I've been excited about this all day long. I got my songs picked out. Uh, I can't wait to sing solos for you because tonight is singing night, right? So, uh, so we're just going to sing together for 30 minutes and, uh, and just have a good time. Uh, and I'm kidding, okay? Uh, I am not singing, and those of you that know me are thankful that I'm not. Uh, but I do enjoy singing, and I do miss uh, that tonight is uh, singing night, and so maybe we, can, maybe we can make it up somewhere down the road uh, because I do enjoy getting together, and uh, I guess maybe one of the, the the things I miss the most about, even though we are having songs in our Sunday morning service, and, and we are singing together as a family at home, uh, I do miss all of us uh, being together and singing. So uh, maybe when we get to come back safely, we'll have a good old singing night and uh, just uh, sing a bunch of, of, of good songs together and uh, enjoy one another's voices and praise to the Lord. So I won't sing tonight. Uh, you can thank me for that later. Uh, but uh, we are going to go back to John 4, and we are going to continue this idea about planting and harvesting and uh, the fields, the agricultural principle that we talked about quite a bit last week. And one of the questions on the study guide that I had printed out or that you might have seen on, on Facebook was, do you have to see the plant in order to know there's a harvest? About question five there. I had a lot of good uh, thoughts on that this week and some discussion about it and and uh, and even some clarification to it. And maybe I ought to ask it a little differently. Uh, you know, in John 4 and verse 35, beginning uh, that whole section there that we are using as our lesson text, Jesus says, do you not say that there are four months and then comes the harvest? Well, he goes on to tell them, you know, lift up your eyes to see that the fields are white for harvest already. And so what I'm asking in that question there, and what I'm asking you and I to consider is, where is our faith? How, how, how developed is our faith? In other words, as we closed last week, we were mentioning, do, do you have to see the, the, the plant? Do you have to see the ears on the corn? Do you have to to, to see the, the silts coming out of the ear of corn to know that you're going to produce and have corn. I hope you don't have to wait that long. I hope your faith is bigger than that. I hope it's deeper than that. I hope it's stronger than that because 
As you know, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. I, I realize that sometimes we plant bad seeds and so they don't come up. But I've never planted a seed that I didn't have faith in the fact that one day I would get vegetables from that seed. Now, that hadn't always happened. You know that. Uh, we've all had bad seed before. We've all tried to save seed and replant later next year or whatever, and that doesn't work out. And so we've all replanted or we've all planted rows of seeds that that just don't come up 100%. And so we had to spot plant, as we used to call it. I never will forget the year that uh, uh, that the soybeans did not come up very well. And so uh, two weeks after we were done, we had to go back and, and spot plant. And uh, my, my papa, he, he hated that worse than anything. He griped and complained and fussed about that the whole time uh, because it wasn't very fun. Uh, you had to go along there and, and papa's whole thing was just cut the whole thing down and start over. And, uh, and that probably would have been easier, maybe even less time consuming. Uh, but you hate to cut down something that's, that's growing and good there. So, so we've all had that experience perhaps in something. More importantly, in this discussion, we've probably all invited somebody to church that didn't come. And if we're not careful, we, we, we try to, to go back and re-invite them or, or go invite someone else and, and, and we get discouraged, we get brokenhearted, uh, we get let down, um, and, and we, we quit trying to produce a harvest because it's time consuming and it's not easy and we've got to go look. You know, I, I remember Papa going down those rows and he'd had to set the planter down for a little while and then pick it back up and set it down a little while. We'd leave a field and I'd ask, you know, well, Papa, did we get them all there? And he'd say, well, who knows, you know, uh, and, and then he got to the point to where he was saying, you know, if, if we did miss one, we'll just say, well, they didn't come up again. You know, we planted bad seed again. That just gets disheartening to keep inviting the same people and them not coming or them not showing any interest. So what I'm asking you is, can you look at the soil and begin to analyze by faith what kind of harvest you might have there? You see, Jesus says, listen, guys, if y'all got to wait four months, that's not walking by faith. That's walking by sight. You look out there and you see, you see the plants. They're, they're ready to be picked. Well, it's not hard to conclude at the time of harvest that there's going to be a harvest or not, depending on how well those crops produce. But can you look at the soil and can you say there's great potential here? And I'm going to invest in that. Let me illustrate that one more way and then let's move on. In the current spot where, I, where I'm gardening right now with my good friend Steve Leeper, the left side, as you look at the garden, is much darker. The dirt's darker. It's, it's richer. It's better soil. Or where I used to garden and my predecessor had horses, there was a spot in the middle of that garden that would grow very well. Every year when I turn the dirt, I can tell you based on the soil what looks good and maybe what's going to have its challenges. So as you move from left to right in our garden spot, you have the soil gets worse and worse. So when you go to passages like Matthew 13 and, and the first nine verses there, or Luke chapter eight, and you start talking about the sower, the parable of the sower. You remember there were four different types of soil. If you, I think you do count the wayside soil there, even though you and I would probably call it a sidewalk today. Back then, it was more of a, a, of a dirt path that had just been packed down. And so seed fell among that type of soil. And obviously, that wasn't going to grow anything. For you and I today, it would be like going out here in the church parking lot and throwing seed on the asphalt. Uh, it, 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 it won't grow. It won't grow there. It's, it's not prepared. It's not ready. But then you have other types of soil like the thorny ground and the stony ground and and so as I look at my garden spot from left to right, I, I have a lot greater faith in the left side of it than I do the right side of it. And it's just the fact of soil type. So what I'm asking you is, can you and I, can we look at and analyze? And you say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. You're saying we need to make judgments. And what I would quickly say to you is you make judgments every day of your life. Like I made a judgment this morning that this pink shirt would be pretty. And some of you are thinking it was a poor judgment call, and that's fine. 
You made judgments yourself. You're making judgments in this recent pandemic on whether it's safe to go here or whether it's safe to go there. We're, we're making judgment calls all the time. Don't, don't, don't tell me that it's not okay to, to judge. I understand what righteous judgment, John 7 speaks to that. I understand what Matthew 7 says, and don't, don't misquote that, uh, about, about judge not that you be not judged. It has, it, 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 you make judgments, okay? So when you look at soul, when you look at the heart and lives of people, I think it's only natural that you make judgments. So that's what I'm asking. Can you see the harvest by looking at the soul? Is your faith in the seed? Luke 8 and verse 11 says the seed is the word of God. The seed is good, okay? We're not planting bad seed here. We're planting the best seed possible. So the variable here is not the seed. The variable is the soul. It's the heart of the person. So how much time and how much effort are you going to invest in soil that is like the right side of my garden? I plant peas over there. We plant stuff that we, we hope will come up. We plant leftover seed over there. You know why? Because we're, we're thinking maybe, maybe not. We hope it does. But, but on the left side, we're confident in that. So we plant good seed in that soil because that's, that's where we have our faith planted. That's where we have our trust in. How much faith do you have to invest? Do you trust it enough to sacrifice? And do you love it enough to be motivated? That's what you're asking about the soul. And here we're talking about people. To be able to see the harvest, Jesus says in verse 35, lift up your eyes. That's really what I want us to discuss for the rest of our Bible class time tonight is what are some things that get in our way? Oh, I ask you about some gathering stories in the Bible. You can talk about the sower. I've already been talking about that. You remember in Matthew 13, there was the wheat and the tares. There's a gathering story there. You remember in uh, Matthew 13, there's a story about fish there where they gathered fish and that dragnet and they, they separated the fish. You could go to Luke 15. There's gathering stories there about trying to seek and to gather the lost. You could go to Matthew 22, and read the first 14 verses, and there's a story there about planning a banquet or planning a feast and going out into the hedges and the highways and gathering people. There's all kinds of stories within the Bible. I just wanted you to be thinking about a few there that talk about the importance of, of gathering, the importance of harvest. But before we get into some things that hinder us from lifting up our eyes, I ask you just to consider with me the most important attitude in all of this. And in my mind and in my humble estimation, Matthew 9 and verse 36, the Bible says that as Jesus entered into the village and he saw the people, he was moved with compassion. If I were to put one word on, on the important attitude that must be involved here, it would be the attitude of compassion. We must have compassion on the lives and the souls of people. We must be willing to take an interest, to have the trust that we need to sacrifice, the faith that we need to invest in them, and the love that we must have to be motivated to work with them. What hinders those three things? Well, as Jesus says in John 4 and verse 35, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Does prejudice get in the way of us lifting up our eyes. Now, when I say the word prejudice, you probably think skin color, and rightfully so. But there are a whole lot more prejudice out there. This, this, this setting, this time in John 4, Jesus is talking to a woman. He's talking to a Samaritan woman. Now, I, I'm going to propose that when, when the disciples came back and they're trying to give him food, and then, and then as she goes and invites other people, when Jesus looks up, he sees these other people coming. And as a result of that, he tells the disciples, you need to get your eyes up. You need to pick your head up and look at all these people beginning to gather out here. They're Samaritans. Probably a lot of women. 
in the group. What are you going to do, Jewish male? Are you going to let your prejudice get in the way? Are, are you going to uh, convince yourself that I don't have to cross this ethnic line? That these people aren't the same as me socially or culturally or all of that would be factual. But are you going to are you going to let that hinder you? You see, God desires a harvest from his people. God desires fruit. Read John 15. When Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches, verse 1. If you abide in me and I, abide, and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. And then he goes on in John 15 to say, if you don't bear fruit, you'll be cut off and thrown into the brush pile. You'll die and wither and be burned. But if you abide in me, for without me, Jesus says in John 15 and verse 4, without being connected to the vine, you can do nothing. God desires labor. God desires harvest. God desires a reaping of that which is being sown. I think about Matthew 20 and the, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard as they went out to gather another gathering story. There's a bunch of them in the scriptures. Jesus loved the agricultural principle. He used it a lot as he was teaching a very simple message. But does prejudice get in the way? Can we see people the way Jesus sees people? Can we look through all of the, the, the barriers or the hurdles that we might put up? Well, that person doesn't, they, they don't, they don't look like me. They don't talk like me. They don't act like me. So their culture's different. Their background's different. Their, whatever prejudice you want to put up there, I just want to broaden your horizon that skin color is not the only way in which you and I can be prejudiced toward people. And certainly skin color is not by any means an excuse at all to... to hinder or to stop the gospel. What about perception? Well, I just don't think they'd be receptive. Have you tried? You know, I think about the disciples here in John 4, and, and I think about them looking up and seeing these people. And, and, and mind you now, this woman from the well has just gone and invited them, and they've just come. So, you think there's some that are that are poorly dressed? You think there's some that that are dirty? I mean, I mean, they didn't all go in and clean up and put on their Sunday best and come to church. You know, I, I think about our perception of people. I think about our perception of each other. You know, you you see me at my best. That's when you see me. You know, I I think about. I was thinking today about this whole live thing, you know, and, and what if this camera was rolling all the time? You see, in a minute, I'm, I'm going to stop this camera and I'm going to go home and I'm going to, I'm going to be Rodney, right? You see, I can, I can turn on the lights and, and I can put the special lights in front of me and, and I can even use special microphones. I can make this look good, sound good with Eddie's help and, and polish all this up. And, and what you perceive could be, could be really inaccurate. Same is true of people. I, I, I know first impressions are, are powerful. And, and in a positive way, we need to use our first impressions to make a powerful influence. But, but on the flip side of that, a first impression can make a very negative influence. And so when you see someone, when these disciples lifted up their eyes, are you keeping your head down because... Well, you just don't you just don't perceive that they would be receptive or want to know. In Matthew 13 and verse 14, right in the middle of all of those parables there, Matthew 13 and uh, gathering parables that I mentioned earlier, in verse 14, indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, Matthew 13:14 which says, you will indeed hear, but will never understand. You will indeed see, but not perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they have closed. Yes, they, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn, and I, 
I would heal them. Jesus, quoting from Isaiah there, says the, the, the perception of these people, they have closed their heart, they've closed their eyes, they've closed their ears, they've closed their mind. And sometimes you and I don't give people a chance to do that because we've already closed it for them. In our perception of them, we've already closed their ears and closed their eyes and closed their heart. Don't do that. Don't, don't let your perception get in the way. See, see everybody the way God sees them. Now, as you spend time with the plant, as you spend time with the soul, rather, and, and strive to plant within the soul, you, you, you may have to not perceive some things, but make some judgments. And what you may realize is that heart is closed. Those eyes are shut. Those ears are not going to listen. And so you may have to write them off as, wayside soul. And you may have to move on because remember the seed that you're planting is the word of God. Be passionate about it. Be powerful about it. Don't, don't stop because you run across some soil that's hard. But, but also don't let your perception of people, well, I've known them all my life and I've, I've watched them and I've seen them. Don't be careful not to let that get in the way. See people the way God sees people. See people as a heart, as a soul. And they may in time force you to move on. Another thing I think about as I think about what might hinder us from lifting up our eyes, as Jesus says in John 4 and verse 35, is the population. And, and not so much the number of the population, but the setting of the population. Meaning that the whole rural country Everybody knows everybody. You know your neighbor sitting on the front porch. Those days are, well, they're gone. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not suggesting that every community is urban in its population, but what I am suggesting is that there is a urban mindset to every community, meaning we don't know our neighbors very much anymore. We don't have this rural setting in which everybody knows everybody and is there to help everybody and, and, and we're willing to. And so because of that, the population has changed and, and, and we are not as connected. We're not as close. We're not as involved. As a matter of fact, if I were to try to get involved with your life, the first thing you would think is, why is he being nosy? The first thing you would think is, well, what does he want? And in reality, I, I, I may just want to be a neighbor. But it's hard in our mindset because the population, the, the culture, the setting of our population has changed such that, that we, we don't lift up our eyes. Another thing I'll call your attention to is our precedence. You know, what, what is our precedence? What is our priority might be a better word. Well, you know, in verse 32 of John 4, they brought him food and they wanted him to eat. And Jesus says in verse 32, I have food to eat that you don't know about. What's he talking about? Well, his priority was in a different place, wasn't it? What he saw as the most pressing matter, his precedence was set on, look out, look at all these people coming. I ain't got time to eat. We got people to teach. And Jesus is trying to help them to change their perception, to change their focus, to change their priority. It may be that our eyes are, are looking down because we've got our priority in a different place. Our precedence is not on reaping a harvest for God. I have a struggle with prejudices. I, I, I'd like to think that my perception of people is pretty good. I I want to see the good in everybody. I, I, I might even give you the benefit of the doubt for a while. I, I'll always be a rural boy. Uh, I never will forget when Chastity and I first got married. I, we were connected to, uh, to the Crystal Springs Church down in uh, South Mississippi, and, uh, and we would drive through Jackson to get there. We would go visit them once a quarter uh, back when I was in college and in our early years of our marriage. We would drive through Jackson and, and I would say, now one day, you know, 
We're going to live in a neighborhood like that. I always thought I wanted to live in the subdivision where, you know, the, the distance between your house and the next house was a lawnmower. And I'm not that guy. I never have been, never will be. And thankfully, the Lord never really opened an opportunity for me to move to that setting. I, I'm, I'm, I'll always be a country boy. I'll always love the field. I'll always love the dirt. I would drive myself miserable if I was living in a place where I couldn't have a garden, where I couldn't work out back. With that being said, I don't think the population's changed me a whole lot in terms of, of how I treat my neighbor, but I know for most it has. I, I, I do get priorities out of line sometimes. I'm a human. My, my precedence may not always be what it should be, but I, 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 this last one is it for me. It's personal time. I only have so much time in the day, and so do you. And you decide how you're going to spend it, and so do I. I'm not wanting to take anything away from... Jesus told the disciples in Mark 6 and verse 31 to come apart, to come apart and rest a while. In other words, come aside. Come, come away and rest a while. To which someone said, if you don't come apart every now and then, you'll come apart. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have personal time. I'm not suggesting that we, we shouldn't have times of getting away and, and relaxing and re recreating ourselves and enjoying some recreation. I'm just simply saying that if we're not careful, we, we can get selfish. I can get selfish. I can get self-motivated with my personal time. I can get greedy. I can get all types of sinful attitudes about my personal time. And I forget the fact that I, I only have so long. And, and of all the things that are important to my life, there should be nothing greater of importance than helping people go to heaven. That starts with me. I've got a soul that I, I need to get to heaven. With the help of Jesus and with the grace of God, I want my soul to go to heaven. And then following that is my family. I want to go to heaven with my family, with my wife, with my kids. And then following that, I want to take everybody I can with me to join me, to be there, to celebrate and to rejoice. I, I can't let my personal... You see, I, I get caught up in this world. I get caught up in worldliness. I get, I get caught up in, well, you know, this is my time. What I forget sometimes is that every moment is a blessing from God. It's not my time, it's His time. I get to choose how I want to spend it, and so do you. And I'm not opposed to taking some time for yourself, but don't lose sight of the fact that God desires a harvest. He's looking to reap where you're sowing. God's looking to give an increase, but you got you got to lift up your eyes to see the fields. John 4 and verse 35, do not say there's four months from now until the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are wide of harvest. Already the one who re reaps is receiving his wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I send you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Paul says, I plant, Apollos watered. God gave the increase. God's looking for a harvest. He's looking to reap where you're sowing. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom? Is that song, that old song we sing. Or are there hurdles that are getting in your way? Jesus says, lift up your eyes. See the fields are wide. There are people right now searching. You may have to use some, some different avenues and venues to reach them and to study with them. But there are people watching. I'm hearing congregations of the Lord's church that normally have four or 500 people on any given Sunday that are now reaching 2,000, 3,000 people. Don't, don't allow the virus to convince you that there's still not a harvest out there. There's a field out there. It's white. And so Matthew 9 and verse 38, but the laborers are few. God needs you working hard. 
are ye? Let's pray as we close today. Father in heaven, thank you for this day and thank you for all that have joined me and will join me later via, via technology and social media and other mediums out there. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the power that it has. Remind us often that the seed we are planting is your precious truth. And because of Jesus and because of the message of the cross, people can be saved. Eternities can be changed. Souls can be washed. Forgiveness can be extended. Grace can be enjoyed. Father, help us to see people the way you see them and to not let hurdles get in our way that we might be that salt and that light that you've asked us and called us to be. And may you be glorified in all that we do. Father, forgive us where we have failed in this day. Bless our families. Bless our health. Bless those who are not healthy, that they might be well and recovered soon. Father, thank you so much for hearing our prayer, for answering according to your will, for loving us. And I pray that you would continue to be with us and guide us. Through the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. May you have the faith to plant, the trust to sacrifice, and the love to motivate. Eternity is at stake here. Heaven is the reward. Don't quit putting that seed in the ground and giving God the opportunity to give the increase. Have a great evening.